Today's speaker, as I said, is Dr. Carrie Lynn Sakuma uh, in our health promotion and health behavior program at the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. Uh, Carrie Lynn got her MPH in biostatistics and epi, epidemiology, you all remember that from uh, webcast number one, um, and her PhD in preventive medicine and health behavior from the University of Southern California in uh, Los Angeles. And Dr. Sakuma shares uh, my passion for tobacco control, so I imagine that may come up uh, over the next hour. Um, Dr. Sakuma's research focuses on racial and ethnic disparities, particularly with regard to tobacco use, including new and emerging products and other substances. She also does some work on co-parenting um, and substance use prevention and teaches a lot of important core courses that um, I know today you'll get into a lot of that um, work on social determinants of health. So without um, further ado, I think we're ready. Um, Dr. Sakuma, I'm gonna mute myself and turn off my video and turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen and get my slides up. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you to OSU Alumni Association for this opportunity. Thank you, Allison, uh, for that nice introduction. Uh, and thank you all uh, who have chosen to join me today to view this uh, webcast or seeing this webcast in the future. Um, I imagine that there will be a wide range of individuals joining us in this uh, presentation and on um, and along different points in the journey of understanding public health, understanding um, social determinants of health and um, all the topics we touch on today. So my hope is that everyone will come away with something of value to learn and grow from here. With that, some of the biggest health crises that we're dealing with today are rooted in historical and fundamental causes that are continuously reinforced today. So it's important for me to offer uh, this apology and warning up front to the audiences uh, who are joining us. Um, anyone who is black, indigenous, or a person of color, I'm very cognizant that this lecture is centered for white audiences. And as you may already know some of the things that I'm gonna touch on, um, and you may experience this in very real ways, know that uh, this, is, this is touching the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, for everyone else, by the end of this lecture, is my hope that you will see how the ties of the past impact your personal lives today. And finally, we're here to, uh, today to examine how place is linked to health and what factors are linked to health. As such, it's imperative that we acknowledge that Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon, is located in the traditional territory of the Chapinefu, uh, with Mary's River Band of, of the Kalapuya. After the Kalapuya Treaty, or Treaty of Dayton, in 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to what is now the Grand Ronde and Silets Reservations and are now members of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Silets Indians. You will see how this is not just a statement, but how these specific events have significance to our health today. Uh, so let me guide you on this journey between past and present and how our health is impacted more um, by our places than by individual choice. So I wanna start here. Imagine for a moment that you were shipwrecked and by luck, you were able to get to an uninhabited island. Where would you choose to build a home? What are the factors that are related to survival? You would probably search for a location that had these things, fresh water source, food source, and shelter. Some of you may also include a location with easy passage to trade. In this case, maybe not too far inland so that you could build a fire and catch the attention of passing ships, for example. There's nothing different about this scenario than that of how communities were built in the past and the needs of survival today. This is important to remember because this represents a pattern of needs. And this means that places were built from purpose and not chance. So when we see maps like these that show us health outcomes, in this case, premature death, and we see such stark differences between counties in the same state, we have to ask ourselves why. What contributes to these differences? I'm sure that all of you have lots of guesses as to why, and while we explore that, I wanna also prod a little deeper into the causes of these differences in mortality or death. 
So let's get a little bit more detailed here. Um, here are the on life expectancy, meaning how old an average person is expected to live. It's calculated at the time of birth. But this is by census tract, so it's a little bit more detailed. And it's more detailed here in, uh, for Oregon. Can you already see pattern? So darker color means you live to longer, um, older ages. Again, we in public health look at these differences and ask why do these differences in mortality exist? Let me zoom in a little bit. So we zoomed in to Corvallis and surrounding areas. For those of you familiar with the area, you can see that there are differences in how old the average person might live across different parts of town. In fact, just looking at Corvallis and comparing to Philomath and Albany, our next door neighbors, you can see pretty dramatic differences in how old the average person will live. And remember how I said that this is not by chance. Communities aren't built by chance. So again, take a look, uh, compare the green a square or a rectangle <laughs> with the orange rectangles. That's a, that's a nearly 10 year difference in life expectancy. And the square footage um, or mileage of this area isn't that big. So why is it that these differences in life expectancy can show up so dramatically in this, in this area? Again, I'm sure you can think of a lot of reasons why these differences exist. So we're gonna to get to exploring those, I promise. Because at the end of the day, I'm gonna ask you what does this all mean? What do these census tracts actually represent when it comes to impacting your health? So according to the CDC, these are the leading causes of death in Oregon. How many of these are preventable? Technically all of these have a, a potential for prevention even accidents, which by definition may not appear to be preventable, but counted in accidents are events such as motor vehicle deaths, poisoning, substance use overdose, falls, drowning, firearms, uh, firearms deaths, transportation deaths, et cetera, um, which public health in the past has had some significant wins in reducing deaths in those categories. The fact that these are preventable is important because it points to our ability to do something about it. Uh, now, while we look at these causes of death, we can think about what things impact these causes of death. I guess the question we want to ask is, what are the causes of the causes of death? So what kinds of things prevent these health outcomes? What are the things we need for a healthy society? So looking at these pictures, you can guess that we're talking about access to affordable health care and treatments, functional public health system, access to affordable nutritious food, access to physical activity, green space and safety, jobs for fulfilling purposes and for income security, affordable housing, free high quality education, free and safe public transportation, and community programs and services like libraries. Place or zip code often represent all of these things wrapped up in space. Like-minded, higher resource people tend to live in similar areas. Low income and marginalized folks are often forced to live in similar areas. This is not by chance. So these things matter because if we can provide these things to a community, then we can solve some of the greatest disparities or differences we see between groups later on. In other words, these things, if provided upstream, can prevent much of the poor health we see downstream. For example, let's think about the number one cause of death, cancer. We can provide healthy diets, exercise, shelter, preventive care. We can get early detection of cancer, which saves lives if we can also provide affordable treatments. In thriving communities, we can have supportive after treatment care. We can imagine all of these things contribute in the long term and across entire lifespans, such that everyone has the opportunity to thrive and live their life to the fullest. And yet, not only do we see differences in death and causes of death between communities, but we also see large disparities in these causes of the causes of death. So instead of saying causes of the causes of death, it's better known and better referred to as social determinants of health. Social and social determinants means that these things are societal factors. Determinants is just a fancy way of saying factors that lead to or contribute to health outcomes. So social determinants of health are the things in which our society creates that inevitably will impact our health. All right, so let me read the definition here. Uh, the social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. These circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, 
power and resources at global and national and local levels. Social determinants of health are mostly responsible for health inequities, the unfair and avoidable differences in health status seen within and between countries. So here's a table, a table, it's quite old by now, uh, but from Kaiser Family Foundation that I tend to use to help audiences see examples of what constitutes social determinants of health. So thinking about um, our experiences today, particularly with COVID-19, you can see how each and every one of these things listed here can really compound a person's risk for contracting or potentially dying from COVID-19. It also can, um, all of these things because of COVID-19, when it affects these areas, employment, income, um, access to uh, housing, playgrounds, parks, et cetera, that's impacting our, um, our ability for health in all these other areas that lead to um, better health and well-being. So things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. So these, these things can compound upon each other. And there's been lots of evidence linking social determinants of health to a myriad of health outcomes. We know things like quality schools, access to healthy food, access to healthcare, clean environments, quality housing are all needed for optimal health of every individual. And much of our work today is focused on directly addressing these social determinants of health to reduce the differences we see between and within communities. For example, in Corvallis, we have made public transportation free. As a community, we decided that transportation is an important priority for health of our community members by providing a way for folks to get to school, earn a living, and get resources such as medical appointments, library services, and recreation. Together, we prioritize addressing that so that downstream effects of this decision means that we are moving some of the barriers for those who cannot afford transportation, could not easily get to appointments, school, or work. That's what it means to reduce disparities associated with specific indicators of social determinants of health. But I'm going to push you folks a little further to think bigger and deeper. In this image, you see the roots of the trees. And the roots of the trees need to be healthy for the tree to grow. I want you to think about the dirt that the tree's in. What's in the dirt that allows for these roots to take hold and flourish? So let's revisit this definition for social determinants of health. This is a little bit updated, um, again, by the World Health Organization. So social determinants of health are the circumstances in which people are born, grow up, live, work, and age. This first part of this definition implies that things just are. They just happen, that it's by chance. But is it? Parents in the audience, consider where your children were born. Why were you in that location? Was it because of a job opportunity? Was it because you had family support? Was it because you were pushed out of housing and needed to find a shelter in a city that provided one? Anyone else? Why are you living where you're living right now? What opportunities or lack of opportunities have led you to leave an environment or to stay? These choices aren't random choices. These decisions are informed by and influenced by systems around you. And those systems are largely economic policies, social policies, and politics. And those systems are in the dirt in which our trees continue to grow and reproduce. Okay, so when we, let's look at this definition again. When we look at social terms of health and the circumstances in which we are born, grow up, live, work, and age, this also includes systems in place to offer health care and services to a community. And it's really key here that we understand these are systems we're talking about. These circumstances are in turn shaped by a wider set of forces, economic, social policies, and politics. So here's the bigger question. If these are circumstances that were shaped by a wider set of forces, who created those forces? For whose benefit and for what purpose? If we want to solve for health disparities and achieve health equity, meaning everyone receives what they need to be healthy, then we really need to take a long, hard look at these systems or the dirt in which we have planted our communities. We have to look at those systems, how we have to set up our social structure and how resource distribution is happening in our communities. And to understand the dirt under which we stand, we have to go back to the origins of Oregon. 
while I don't have time to give you all the grand details here, I will give you some key factors that continue to shape the health of Oregonians today. Land ownership was key and is key to economic and political power from the beginning of the US. That's still true today in most respects. If you have an address, then you have privileges. If you own your own house, you have economic privileges. You can vote, you can um, borrow against the equity in your house for college tuition for your kids, and it's taxed at a lower rate. If you remember from the founding of this country, white male landowners were the only ones who counted. This is a fundamental driver in the legislation that will have lasting impacts until today. This is all about white supremacy. And I know that makes people feel uncomfortable because it conjures images of Ku Klux Klan and other hate groups. But white supremacy, if put simply, it's the ideology that white European ideals and ways of life were better than any other group of beings or perhaps the only group that counts. And so I want you to hang out with me for a bit so we can see how that has imp implications to our health in Oregon today. And here we have a picture of the Oregon Trail. Notice that it starts in Missouri. Prior to Oregon joining the Union, colonists claimed large tracts of land without survey, without treaties with any Native American tribes. At the time, believe it or not, it was illegal to steal land without the federal government creating treaties with Native American tribes. But the Oregonian colonists figured that they'll make a provisional government to legitimize their claim to the land. When Oregon would join the US, it was already written up and it would just slide on through, which is kind of actually what happened. Um, so there's obviously a lot more that happened during this time, but let's be clear that the land was stolen then and it was stolen again once the federal, uh, by the federal government through this quote unquote Indian law uh, to extinguish Indian title. So this is three steps uh, to extinguish Indian title. First, the US Senate would first appoint a treaty commission to negotiate with individual tribes. Once ratified, a formal survey would measure and transform land into delineated boxes on a map. And third, these boxes would form a public domain that the federal government would then sell or donate. Being able to dispossess uh, Native American tribes from this land led to two major things that continue to directly impact health today for all Oregonians. So Oregon settlers in 1848, um, uh, be Oregon became an organized US territory. And in that, Oregon settlers were anti-slavery -slave supporters. Now that sounds like a great thing, but the reason they opposed slavery wasn't on moral grounds, but because settlers did not want to compete with landowners who utilized enslaved labor. So it was to keep down competition. Because at this time, this is just about uh, when Civil War was ending and Reconstruction uh, was about to happen. So they were afraid of the uh, movement of um, those groups of people. The presence of any Black people enslaved or free would introduce a servile underclass, undercutting white laborers. So this is also represents white supremacy in disguise. In other words, if freedom came to Oregon, if freedmen, sorry, if freedmen came to Oregon to work, then what would differentiate them from white laborers? So not only did they um, join the US as a free state, but they also wrote in black exclusion laws, which meant that um, Black and Chinese, and later extended to other um, groups, uh, could not live or work in the state. That has lasting impacts to the dem demography of today. In 1850, the Donation Land Claim Act, which is really important for us to, to remember, the Donation Land Claim Act was the most generous land distribution bill in US history. It legally confirmed the settlers' original claims and granted future settlers an unprecedented 320 acres for white males, or excuse the term, quote unquote, half breed Indian males with white fathers, and an additional 320 or 640 acres total for married couples. In order to get that land, it meant removing Native Americans finally from their land. And again, white supremacy reigned. They couched that move as a moral and civil interest of the white race equally with the claims of humanity required the removal of Indians to some place where their condition may be improved. 
So these quotes are coming directly from the leaders of that time. The value of tribal lands expropriated by settlers can never be adequately assessed in value. And we'll come back to this point. The extension of the DLCA and the Homestead Act of 1862 contributed to the incentive uh, uh, to travel to or travel the Oregon Trail and bring white women for double the acreage. But it also meant it kept a segregated white class from intermingling with other races on the West Coast, which was by this point in time was actually quite populated. But let's take a look at the profound impact on Oregon uh, from this, this period of time. Let's look at impact of something that happened 200 years ago. It privatized over 2.5 million acres to white settlers. Because they gave out such enormous land grants, it meant your nearest neighbor was a minimum of 160 acres away. Even if you were to make that land prosperous at the time, you had no way to sell or trade in larger markets. It discouraged urban migrants since the DLCA did not include towns and cities. So only specific groups of people would be attracted to the difficult travel across the land from Missouri to Oregon and live pretty much in isolation. So again, none of this is by chance. In fact, it exacerbated socioeconomic inequality. Remember the island scenario where we started with, this wasn't an uninhabited land. In fact, the settlers squatted on viable resource rich hunting and fishing grounds and claimed those acres for themselves. And by doing so, the earliest settlers uh, claimed the most productive farmland and they had twice the size of later claimants. So that set up a structure of economic inequality from the beginning and during that time later when it came to selling those properties to larger corporations. Furthermore, by the 1900s, most of the claims are sold or mortgaged or abandoned. Now you may be thinking, why, why does all of this history matter? So remember this map, remember this image. Economic investment in rural areas were and are incredibly limited today. It means the systems that could help support strong social determinants of health leading to healthy outcomes are largely missing from these communities. So we have to really think about what will it take to reduce those inequalities, not only within those areas, but across the entire state. And we'll come back to that question because I also wanna point out a second major thing that resulted from white supremacy and the colonization of Oregon. The 1862 Morrell Act. Now this act hits close to home because Oregon State is a land grant institution and benefits and continues to benefit from this act. Most colleges and universities would not exist without this federal aid. So this act was established, um, had established land grant institutions for greater access to education. It donated public lands to several states and territories to provide college for the benefit of agriculture and mechanic arts. This was the first federal aid to higher education. 11 million acres belonged to about 250 tribal nations helped create 52 universities. But where did the US government find the land to donate? Remember that three step process to dispossess Native Americans from their land? This meant coerced treaties and violent removal of tribes from their homes. And that third step of that process was to sell or donate land. This is the legacy of land grant institutions. Now our history is complicated. We can acknowledge the pain of the past and we can continue to benefit from the Morrell Act. We can be proud of our mission that we're committed to teaching, research, and outreach and engagement and to promote economic, social, cultural, and environmental progress for the people of Oregon, the nation, and the world. And if you don't recognize that, that is the mission of Oregon State University. We can be proud of those things and continue to work towards those things. And we can recognize that the lands and the opportunity we continue to benefit from are not equitable or fair for the descendants of the Native Americans who were forced off these lands or murdered. Of the 30,986 students, only 149 are Native American. If education as a social determinant is important for health and well being, and those without the means to obtain that education because their families were dispossessed of land and removed to reservations with few resources, then we really need to think about how we're contributing to that fundamental causes of health. So these are hard words and they're hard words to hear, they're hard words to say, they're hard words to accept. 
Uh, but we cannot escape that these three systems of ideology, white supremacy, racism, and colonization, are connected and fundamental to prosperity and health of Oregon and the nation. And while the nation focuses on racism as a public health crisis, it's easy to look at the extreme and think of hate speech and hate groups as white supremacists and racism being limited to interpersonal reactions and interactions or symbols. But what I'm asking you to do is to remember that these things are systems that were at the founding of the state and country until we can reckon with these fundamental causes, the dirt that we're planted in. We will need to continue, we will end up continuing to re repeat the systems and we will still see the same disparities and poor health outcomes for all but the most privileged. Um, so I want to put it all together for, for us for a second. Pulling it all together, the fundamental causes of health inequities lead to differences in social determinants of health because of the way we set up our society and the ways in which we redistribute, redistribute resources. Differences in social determinants of health lead to differences in uh, what we see in causes of death among race ethnic groups, but also so socioeconomic groups. We're not even talking about the ways in which we as a society collectively lose when these large differences present in our society. Think about the human capital we lose in the labor market because folks aren't healthy enough to contribute to society in the prime of their lives. Think about the waste and resources we have because we are con constantly dealing with public health crises and many of them, the same crises over and over again. So here's where we get real a bit. Let's get practical. What can we do short of turning back time? You might be asking, what can I do? Right, so what can we as a community do and what as I as an individual can do? So white supremacy, racism, colonization are hard words and it seems like it happened long before our time. But in fact, it is a system that is perpetually going, um, repeating itself over and over again. And as I like to say uh, with my kids, you know, these are hard things, but we can do hard things. These are all systems of wealth and power that are fundamental causes of disparities in social determinants of health. It's in the dirt and it even shapes the mountain we stand on. These inequities uh, were produced and codified in our laws and policies from the start based on white supremacy, based on racism. And those aren't my words, but the words of the founders of this state and nation. So those systems that were created based on those, uh, these hard words, continue to impact us all, regardless of whether you agree or disagree or even know about it. We see the impact to fewer resources and investment, economic stability in rural and pioneer um, areas, which until today, you probably did not link those things with the systemic racism uh, happening 200 years ago. The place now manifests much of the social determinants we see as contributing to poor health. If we cannot see these systems and the causes of the causes of the causes, then we are bound to repeat it over and over again and never truly solve the problem. Race, like any ideology, requires reinforcement and reproduction throughout daily rituals. And that's what we see in our laws and our bylaws and our interactions um, in our policies. So as a community, what can we do? We can continue to work across all of these levels to improve health for all. We can look for when there are disparities in causes of death across our populations. We can look for differences in social determinants. We can also look for what is producing these differences in our society through fundamental causes of health inequities. Right now, we're really only just starting to address social determinants of health. So for example, we can work, as we work across all these levels for better health, um, primarily we were focusing on the individual. This individual has social risk. They don't have stable housing, right? That's, that's a social risk that this person has. So how do we fix it for this person? We can start to address that at the social determinant level. This community has no affordable housing. So maybe we can address more than just this person, but we can address many people who, does, who cannot afford housing in our community. And so how might something look, look like for that? We can designate certain um, new buildings to be affordable housing. We can create 
um, policies that limit rental increases. Um, there's many different creative ways of addressing this social determinant. But when we think about the fundamental cause, and if we name the fundamental cause as racism manifested, for example, in this case, such as redlining, inequitable taxation, and building permit policies, then we can actually start to address the, the inequitable redistribution of resources uh, that, re that recre recreate uh, this happening over and over again to marginalized communities. So in order to do all of that, we need comprehensive strategies and investment into the communities most impacted by this historical and continuing racist and colonialist, po colonialist policies. We need to start calling it out for what it is. Uh, we can keep looking for differences in health outcomes. For example, we can look at black and white morbidity mortality, but until we address that fundamental cause, we're wasting resources that can help all of us be healthier. And when I think about all the cuts and restrictions surrounding SNAP benefits, for example, because as a community, we imagined the hypothetical black welfare queen and chose to monitor, restrict and, restrict and judge who is worthy of food it meant so much more millions of people, primarily white people, went hungry and continue to go hungry in this wealthy country. Now imagine if you could take this opportunity, particularly this opportunity in, in COVID where all of society's rules are kind of up in the air. If we could take this opportunity to provide everyone with food delivered to their door, rent forgiven during this pandemic, simultaneously employing local farms and delivery systems and keeping everyone safe, we can reimagine our social structure, but we cannot treat health and well-being as an isolated thing that happens by chance or that we as individuals have complete control over everything. None of this is random. We have created a system that perpetuates these disparities and will continue to do so until we dismantle it. We've got lots of work to do. So you might be asking, well, that's big. Those are really big ideas. What can I as an individual do? So here's three things that you can do, right? Learn, listen, and practice. Like anything else, you can always benefit from more education. We have a social justice institute uh, run by Jane Waite within our university community. We have our Office of Institutional Diversity. We have seven cultural centers across campus and numerous student-run groups, all of which are open to everyone to learn and join. Recently, the Center of Teaching and Learning just pulled together a program where they distributed free books. Let me see if I can find it. Here's an example of, no, maybe it won't let me. I have to pull that off. Um, free books for uh, instructors so we can work together toward more inclusive practices in teaching in the fall. There's workshop, uh, workshops, um, books, YouTube videos, podcasts. There's so much going on right now for free um, in our, not just in Oregon, not just in our community, but out there in, in the other. When you have a visceral reaction to a term, for example, take a step back and examine that feeling. Take the time to look up a term before you speak on impulse. Deliberate practice is key to not just recognizing these moments, but recognizing the dirt that we're in. What is contributing to this? All right, so that's at a personal level and that's well and dandy. I, I highly encourage everyone working on themselves, but it can't stay within our heads, right? We can't, this is not work for personal growth. This is about working to change our society for more equitable and just health. So what can you do? You can contribute and join. There are many ways to contribute to better health for all. Find those folks who are already doing the work in the area you feel most, most compelled to contribute. Interested in early education? Find those groups. Interested in incarceration issues? Find those groups. There are experienced groups out there who have been doing this work for years, if not decades, if not centuries. All right? Uh, find those who are particularly led by Black, Indigenous, and other marginalized groups, and then follow their lead. You can choose to contribute your time, effort, money, or talents, but let them tell you what's needed. And finally, get engaged. Public health starts local. Yes, you're absolutely gonna hear me say you should vote, but you'd also help others vote. You should also know who and what you're voting for. But that's at the bottom line, like 
absolutely you should vote. But you can also get uh, participate by engaging with your neighborhood parent teacher association. Um, coordinated care organizations in Oregon are fantastic. They have, um, for example, our local intercommunity health network. CCO has um, work groups and um, open to the public to be engaged with what work is going on in our communities. Uh, local food banks. You can attend University Board of Trustees meetings. There are ways to get engaged in the areas that, that you personally want to see improved because all of this work needs to happen. But whatever you choose, whatever you choose, always question how it impacts the most marginalized groups, the ones who do not have the power and wealth distributed flowing towards them. You may not have the answer. No one might have the answer, but it's really important to start with the challenge. Who does this impact and how does it impact them? And finally, I just want to leave uh, with this caveat. There is no end game here. There's no certificate you'll receive for being one of the good guys or an anti-racist. There's no finish line. This is a long-term commitment toward better health and justice for all. So I know that sounds daunting, but this is, this is where we're at, okay? So um, I think it was Conan O'Brien who, who stated this he, in a conversation he was having with W. Kamal Bell. He said, it's kind of like exercise, right? Um, there's no like, I've achieved the most health or I've achieved, I've achieved my goals for health after doing like a couple of sit-ups. You're always working to achieve optimal health. You never get there. There's no like actual end. Like, okay, I've done my hundred sit-ups, therefore I'm healthy. So it's, it's kind of like that where it's constant practice, constant application and commitment toward better health for all. So the Oregon Trail began because two Missouri senators wanted to claim the land and have white settlers protect the Pacific Northwest for US interests. Those men created the foundation for the territory's laws and the donation land claims law and black exclusion law. The Missouri senators were named Louis F. Lynn and Thomas Hart Benton. This is our legacy. And when we think about factors that impact our health, then we need to think beyond just the risk factors for individual health and individual disease. The good news is that collectively, we can change the direction. We can change for the better, but we will never be perfect. So I'm gonna leave this, uh, these words from imperfect men that we can commit to work toward for to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure tra domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. So with that, I am looking forward to a pretty robust discussion in our question and answers, and thank you. Carrie Lynn, thank you so much. Um, okay. Would you mind terribly maybe putting those words up again and more perfectly? Sure, um, absolutely. For, for us on, on the call to reflect on. And um, I have, I have so many scribbles and notes um, as your teammate in this that I'm not totally sure where to start. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna ramble for a second, um, stream of consciousness style, while I also encourage folks listening to add um, their thoughts, comments, or questions um, to the box, to the Q and A box. I think one of the really important things for me as moderator is just acknowledging like who I am in this discussion, right? I'm a, I'm a white lady, uh, middle-aged. Uh, I only know what I know. And at the same time, I know that we have work to do. And I love what you said about, it's great to be proud of our land grant mission, right? We do wonderful work here at Oregon State University and also have an acute awareness that we have more work to do. And sort of being in that place, I think is really important. Um, another, um, I think another really important um, insight from thinking about factors that influence health and going through the causes of the causes of the causes, like peeling back an onion, uh, is that we do, we get down to, to racism and that particular term is a shorthand for a system 
that wasn't created by any one of us, right? It's not personal. Uh, it, it, uh, not personal for everyone. It becomes personal, but it is about a system and not about, um, you said something about, you know, white supremacy, we automatically think of hate groups and it's like, no, it's, it's much bigger than that. Yes, sure. And there's this other larger picture and, you know, racism is not just interpersonal, but rather it's sort of woven in, um, to power structures. Um, uh, so um, let's start. Um, let's start here. If there, hopefully, this is going to be maybe a tiny bit simple or, or a recap. But if there are folks who are on the call that you know they're wide-eyed and like, oh my goodness, I am such a beginner. I don't even know where to start. Um, what do you have guidance for them? Sure. Um, so it depends on on where you are in that kind of um, knowledge base. So um, uh, what I've been reading is that, you know, folks who enjoy reading and white audiences specifically uh, mm -hmm. tend to like um, books like White Fragility or Anti-Racist just to begin. Um, I end up actually recommending a book from, um, let me see, I have it right here. Uh, so you want to talk about race by Ijeoma Oruo. And she's actually in the Seattle area. So, uh, but it's really accessible. Um, and if you if you uh, are in, on Instagram, she actively um, engages with audiences there. But but she also posts excellent things to think about and and consider and and what how to think about these things. Um, but I also recognize that you know academics read, <laughs> uh, white audiences read, but that might not be. Um, that's, that might not be your thing and that's okay. So there's lots of workshops online. Um, if you're, again, social media can be used for good, I think it just depends on how you curate, uh, who you follow and what messages you, you read and how diverse those views are. Um, so I'd like to recommend on Instagram, um, Rachel Cargyle, Lisa Renee Hall, uh, Leila Sayad. Uh, so those folks um, often do anti-racism work um, and, and are engaging with audiences across a broad, broad spectrum, wherever you are on this journey. Um, so I find those uh, folks to be helpful. And they have, if you follow the hashtag, so you wanna talk about race, um, I think there's reading groups all across the US and, and in fact worldwide that, that are grappling with um, how they're interpreting the world today. Um, but podcasts are great too. Um, I like NPR Code Switch, it's very accessible. Um, there's lots and lots of YouTube documentaries. Uh, we can, you can start with 13th, which is well done. Uh, it's actually on Netflix, but Ava du, uh, DuVernay um, released it for educational purposes. So it's free for everyone on Netflix, if you have access to that. I mean, um, sorry, on YouTube as well. But there's things like, um, you know, more locally, there have been documentaries on the Albina um, neighborhoods in Portland, Oregon, and Vanport. Um, there's there's certainly um, lots of information on that. Um, but uh, you know, if you just have maybe 20 minutes and you just don't have time to to really engage, or you don't know where to start, really, I find that comedians are extraordinarily great for this moment um, because they get to tackle big, really big, interesting, but hard discussions with data and um, and distill it down for us to understand and understand it in ways that, that we may not even have thought about before. So I recommend um, Trevor Noah and Hassan Minaj. They have excellent teams that put together really great, um, I guess, production of, of understanding these concepts and these issues, particularly pairing it with what's going on right now in this instant. So um, I find that that's, that's been really helpful as well to really understand what's going on. Um, but that's, that's some of the many different resources I, um, I can recommend. I think that's a good starting list, right? There are podcasts, um, following hashtags on social media, I think is a good way, you're right, to be exposed to different voices and new voices and and people of color who are willingly serving as teachers, right? Which is something that, um, that's a gift. That's really generous of, of folks um, to serve as teachers in a time uh, when things are, are complicated and tough to learn. You mentioned um, Portland and a couple of neighborhoods and I wanna get to some of the questions. Sure. Um, we have one person who um, 
wonders if there are some maybe more specific resources for the Portland area on who is doing the work. Um, it's feeling a little broad for them. I know in my own experience, um, I've been looking at PDX um, hashtags and anti-racism hashtags and then, and so groups are starting to come together for me uh, that way. Do you have other resources for folks um, in the Portland area who'd like to link in to folks who are doing the work? Sure. So um, I didn't grow up in Oregon. Uh, so the history of Oregon, history of Portland has been um, has been a st steep learning curve for me. Uh, but but this work has been done, has been going on for quite some time. If you don't know where to go, I always suggest starting with looking at the local chapters of NAACP, um, looking at chapters of, of folks who, who, you know, every every area in society that you have interest in. So for example, I named education for one, um, neighborhood gentrification or, uh, or under the guise of development. Um, there are groups out there that, that are starting to do the work. So if you have a favorite uh, social media that you like to use, so uh, Twitter, Instagram, so on and so forth, I would actually start identifying um, folks who are in regions that you're interested in. So for PDX, um, here's an example, uh, local restaurateurs in, in Portland, because, you know, there's great food there. Uh, local restaurateurs who are um, in the Portland area who are starting to post, they posted um, things about their, their stores being closed, um, how to help out neighborhoods uh, with uh, funding. You start recognizing the same folks posting these these ways of um, redistributing some of the wealth that they have or finding ways to help um, organizations. So I think in their hashtags they'll put like restaurants for anti-racist work. Um, recognizing that you know um, maybe they're dealing with homeless issues. If you're interested in homeless issues look up those things. Um, but you know it's really hard. It's one of those things that you if you don't know you don't know. Right. And so what I try to do is identify someone that is speaking up about these things in that region. So um, a Filipino restaurant or owned restaurant, uh, they might be posting stuff on their social media or their website. Um, Pips Donuts was a surprise one for me just because I didn't know much about Pips Donuts, but apparently they're really great donuts. Uh, they started posting things about how people can help support the neighborhood um, um, food um, food and shelters. And so you just start picking up on who's doing that um, and who they're connected with. But again, look for the organizations that are already established. Um, I always go to NAACP um, because those are the folks that have been on the ground um, for a very long time in each of these regions. And so that's where I would start. Um, and I, uh, I think I've just heard from uh, Casey Farm, our fearless organizer, Oregon Housing Alliance is a good um, organization uh, for folks who are interested in housing in particular as a social determinant of health, um, which um, again, in that sort of layering in the onion goes all the way back to very old policies that continue to right. um, create uh, residential segregation and poor resource allocation and all of those things. Um, speaking of neighborhoods, uh, how about this, um, can we, we have a question. I'm going to, I'm going to read it. Yeah. Shouldn't we, t we call poverty out explicitly as a contributor to say, for example, broken windows neighborhoods? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love this question because uh, you often hear about broken windows as a, as a theory as to why um, there needs to be a lot of um, Crime, why there is a lot of crime and why there's such heavy police presence in a neighborhood. Because if you don't uh, deal with this broken window, then everything kind of falls apart. But, but that theory in itself has fallen apart. The studies that were originally written um, have been completely demolished. Um, and, and it's really important to recognize that it, that is exactly what I say. When I say racism, like any ideology, keeps perpetuating itself over and over again through ritual, through rep repetition. This is, some, this is a stereotype that you hear. This is a theory you hear over and over again with no basis in truth. Um, and poverty absolutely is a contributor to why a society um, has pockets of, of communities that are falling apart. 
those areas and you can tie this back again we don't have time to go through through um, the delineation and in a in a course that I teach I might do that um, but but let me just quickly show you how how poverty actually plays that role um, you know the reason why poverty is present in some communities is because of the redistribution of, of funding. And when you take two neighborhoods, say a predominantly white neighborhood and a predominantly black neighborhood, and you look at the taxation of property tax for, for each one. Now the white neighborhood might pay more in terms of dollar amount, but the proportion of homeowners in black neighborhoods actually pay more proportionally to um, to taxation and that tax then gets contributed to you know the local uh, tax fund and and that funding gets actually redistributed in different ways and none of which that services that uh, black neighborhood and so when we when we talk about poverty poverty isn't a mistake and it certainly is happening but it's not happening due to you know individuals living in poverty it's oftentimes the systems like taxation systems it's redistribution of wealth that happens but it flows in the opposite direction of what most of us think about like we always think about well well the taxes um, are providing all of these social services those taxes wouldn't have to support those social services if in fact we took care of those neighborhoods fairly from the beginning. And so again, when we're talking about those social determinants and poverty being one of them, um, the question is, can we think about a step backwards or, step, or a broader step upwards to see why is there poverty in the first place and why is certain communities impoverished and others not? And what's, what keeps that, um, that disparity growing um, what systems are put in place that keeps that disparity growing? So, um, excellent question, and I do think that um, you know, as we're talking about these issues for these communities, we have to still step back and ask, why does that even exist? Why are we still seeing these differences? In so, in in so much of this, I can't even in in the questions, you know, I can't help but you know, sure, yes, poverty, but then behind that and behind that and then, you know, behind that and, and sort of looking at these um, lines of causation, even though they're not clean lines. Here's a related question. Um, we talked about broken windows and poverty and police presence, and we're thinking a lot about this now. This is one of the questions that came in during the registration. And the question is, do you have information you could share about how unequal police presence can be a factor in life expectancy and community health? And I, you know, in my own mind, it's like, well, why are the police there? Um, what is that a symptom of? Um, I'll let you, I'll let you, <laughs> let you take that one. Yeah, that was, that's a great question as well. Um, so starting at the question itself, um, yes more police, and I, I wanna broaden this out a little bit. It's not just police, right? It's policing of people. So um, policing of particular black and brown bodies, right? So it's not just um, the organized uh, police force, but it's also people in the community that's always watching and always um, um, judging and, and um, trying to control uh, a community. And I think that in itself and through our racist policies and interactions and, and expectations and all of those things, all of those things wear on uh, people of color. And those things certainly wear on physical health. And so if we want to boil it down to physical health, we can absolutely do that, right? There's lots and lots of evidence that's starting to show, um, has shown, I shouldn't say starting to, has shown over decades now that uh, the impact of racism or the differences we oftentimes see as race, but really what, what it's capturing is the differences in experience of, experiences of racism is um, weathering effects. So the impact of stress on cardiovascular systems, the, on our immune systems, on um, the inflammation of all of our bodily functions. We see our, at the genetic level, we see um, telomere shortening for our, um, 
our bodies. And so when you talk about physical health um, and what that means and the environment that impacts that, it can work at the genetic level all the way up to um, psychological and physical health. And that's pretty um, impactful when you think about that. And when we're talking about police presence, um, we have to, again, yes, absolutely, because it's policing of bodies, but, but for certain communities, it also means life or death. And so you have to um, consider that they are, they are under extraordinary stress of, of monitoring their every action. And so, you know, to make this a little bit more accessible for folks who might not be able to walk in those people's shoes. You know, if you were working at your desk every day and your boss would pop in at random moments of time to check to make sure you're doing work and, and monitoring every keystroke and you can't make a mistake or you'll be fired, right? And if you get fired, you can't afford health insurance. You can't health, afford health insurance. Your kid might not get the diabetes medicine that person needs, right? And so you see all of these things. Now imagine that person popping in all the time, monitoring and policing how you act, how you behave, how you breathe. Um, you can imagine the level of stress, even just popping in that level of stress and always monitoring and always worrying about that person. So now, if you think about a person popping in and they don't like how you reacted to that and you could die because of that, that's all weathering. And whether or not uh, you can recognize it for what it is or not, that's happening and being measured in our society. So I don't think that's the question um, that's established. But when you step back and you ask why, why is it that certain communities are policed more than others? That's when you get to the bigger question of, of, of you know, how can we change the system? Why is the system unfair in that regard? And then we're getting back to um, white supremacy and racism in our codified policies um, that come out that way. Yeah, and um, and certainly the you know the defund the police hashtag, um, you know is 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 it it's simplified clearly um, because that's what hashtags do. But that movement itself is is asking us to reconsider how we spend scarce resources, right? Do we spend scarce resources on policing in a typical sense, or do we spend them on health and human services or uh, any of the other? Um, any of the other categories of effort, you know, as a community like Corvallis did, for example, let's invest in transportation. Um, these are all really important questions. And, you know, as someone who's worked in community, a lot of my career, it's true, right? We as a community get to decide uh, what we want our, our, um, our cities and towns uh, to look like. And this is all really important work to ask ourselves these questions. Uh, we've gone we've gone a little long, and I think we're going to go maybe one more question. How's that sound? That sounds great. Okay. And also, um, I, before you start on that last question, um, another thing that you can think about is, you know, Oregon is great in that we have coordinated care organizations mm -hmm. um, that that is about community, is about health, is about addressing uh, these social determinants of health. And like I said, you know, I gave an example of our own IHNCCO, but but Oregon Health Authority has public hearings. They have public meetings that are open. Um, the each each IC um, sorry each coordinated care organization, public health agencies, all have meetings that are public, and so you can start there. And oftentimes, the people you see there are the groups that are doing the work that you might be interested in um, contributing to. So that's another way to to really engage in areas that that maybe. Um, you might not be part of but are moving to or you're part of that group but you're you don't know yet how to get in touch with folks so so start at one anchoring point and listen to the folks um, who are are doing the work or who raise these concerns and and start there um i um i was looking up while you were talking um uh for those on the call who aren't um totally familiar with coordinated care organizations they um, are the sort of care home for people who are covered under the Oregon Health Plan. Uh, so, and, and the great news about CCOs is that um, the, they're paid for the value that they deliver. So how healthy are folks in the population rather than did they see their doctor every 12 months, which are very different um, questions as you as you know, and the next meeting of the Social Determinants of Health work group, I'll see you there, is July 21st. 
for anyone on the call um, who's in the local area, the IHN um, CCO area. Um, oh gosh, what should the last question be? Well, before you get to, if you um, have another question, I know someone is asking about this graphic here. Yeah, let's do um, that. Let's talk about that and then we'll talk about follow-up resources. Sure. So um, I actually, I follow a lot of journalists and this is coming from a high, um, oh gosh, I'm totally blanking on it right now, but, but it's a publication that, that um, Native American um, journalists have put together and uh, High Country News, I believe. Um, and they had an article that was really great about land uh, grant institutions. But this specific um, graphic, and uh, it's an interactive graphic. And I'm trying to find, give me a second here. I'm going to have to go back one. Um, I will type into, or I will name it, uh, where we get the, where this information came from. It is from www dot l a n d t r a b u dot org and so it's really interesting it's it, it's um i think it's land grab u dot org um but it's really interesting because they were able to um i guess graph out all the different parcels of land from from that indian act okay so the extinguishing of indian land act and if you notice um let me see if I can do this. If you notice that the land isn't the actual where the university is situated, the parcels of land came from different states and different regions and was given or donated to Oregon State University. And if you look at the graphic on the right, it demonstrates um, some of the estimates, right? So it, in 1870, um, this was all of these land uh, were, were granted by the state, 100% um, of share of that grant was given. About 91,000 acres were received. The U.S. only paid $1,779 and the endowment principal raised from the grant is about 208,000. And so, and at the time, if you think about it, colleges weren't really that big, right? We're not talking about 30,000 students. We're probably talking about less than 100. Um, and so for them to receive such a, a a huge amount of um, injection of federal aid, um, really, literally, we probably wouldn't be standing. Um, and so this is, um, this is something that we continue to benefit from. And like I said, we can make good on, on the promise of access of education, but we probably should pay more attention to who has that access um, and, and make it even broader for those who, who really contributed, like who paid the cost for us to exist. And so I think that's some, some of the discussions that, that probably should be happening now and well into the future. I know that that discussion has been um, brought up in the past, but I'm not sure that um, it, it may not have been received well. <laughs> but you can trace back, if you go to that website, you can track um, all the land grant institutions and their land. Um, you can go down to the parcel level and see what's standing there now. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes it's just open lot and um, somebody bought that and that's what contributed to our, our land grant institution. Yeah. What's, I think that's a wonderful place. Um, thank you again, um, Dr. Carrie Lynn Sukuma for um, so generously offering um, this talk, uh, for putting together the material. I know that you've um, really been thoughtful over the weeks uh, to put this together and we so appreciate your time. Um, I, I, I think uh, what I would like to leave us with as we close uh, this series is that um, to borrow uh, the slogan of the Office of Institutional Diversity, we, we have work to do. Uh, we have a very proud land-grant mission. Uh, land-grant universities were created uh, for the people, uh, for the folks who had not been getting educations, um, which were the folks who were not white men. Um, and yet, uh, look at the legacy that, that we have. So um, it's a both and, it's a yes, recognize, and a keep going.